Good afternoon, everybody. Just really quick as we're getting the final things set up here. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Joseph Bell. Um, we'll run this session, if you will. I'd like to express a special thanks to Scotty Strachan and Renee Brown from the Enviro Sensing Cluster. They afforded me an opportunity to host this session. Uh, there was, they didn't have the opportunity to make it over to the East Coast. Renee is in Mexico and Scott is in Nevada, I believe. So uh, they have extended me an opportunity. Thanks. They extended me the opportunity to host the session. So super grateful for them. Um, really excited about this session, right? So we're going to talk about uh, the spectrum from points on the ground, I think, to outer space with respect to data collection and uh, data transmission, and then ultimately, right, once that data is transmitted, we have the ability to do work on it and let that data work for us. Uh, we have four speakers. We're going to have Jacqueline Lamone, mm -hmm. Lamone um, David Coyle, uh, James Gallagher, and Daniel Coop is on the line from Virginia Tech. So we're going to take behind uh, the structure of the session. We're going to have four presentations, look for 12 to 15 minutes each, and then we'll have a 20 to 30 minute talking session at the end to gather thoughts and other um, ideas. So without further ado, here's Jacqueline okay. Ramon from NASA. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there are two of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> <this> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I need it, but <laughs> Okay, so uh, my name is Jacqueline Lemoyne and uh, I am, uh, in fact, I changed the title from what was advertised, but uh, the content will be will be the same. So I am only going to talk about one of the two thrusts of the, of the Advanced Information System Technology Program at uh, in the NASA Earth Science Technology Office. So just a, a little background for those, uh, those of you who don't know uh, what is ESTO and AIST. Uh, ESTO is the Earth Science Technology Office in the Earth Science uh, Division at uh, NASA headquarters. And uh, the main goals of, uh, of ESTO is to look at technology development uh, for, uh, for future uh, Earth science uh, missions and, and measurements, mainly based on, uh, on the decadal survey. But, uh, and uh, ESTO, uh, in general, looks both at hardware and software so there, there are uh, several programs, and the main programs are the observation uh, capability programs, the, the AIST program that I am going to uh, talk a little bit more in detail. And, and there is also the INVEST program, which is a validation program for both uh, hardware and software technologies. Uh, within ESTO, the goals of AIST, which is the Advanced Information System Technology program, are to, uh, to spe uh, spearhead the technology to both look at uh, at the new observing uh, strategy, new um, new observing uh, new measurements, uh, trying to see how we can uh, we can um, ha uh, develop new capabilities, especially through distributed sensing. And uh, from uh, from a science uh, investigation point of view, look at how we can uh, we can use the new software technologies and uh, and integrate. Um, uh, uh, mission uh, models and uh, and data and new computational capabilities for uh, for facilitating uh, science investigations. So, <clears throat> so this is what uh, I just described uh, at a high level, the two thrusts of of AIST. And I'm not going to talk too much about ACF because it's uh, not so much related to to this particular uh, session. But uh, I am going to describe in a little bit more detail what are the new observing strategies. So, so as I just said, you know, the new observing strategies are really to look at, uh, at uh, optimizing the me measurement acquisition by, by um, integrating diverse uh, observing capabilities. And these capabilities can be in space, in, uh, in the air, or uh, on the ground. And uh, using um, distributed uh, spacecraft missions and the uh, old idea of sensor webs, which is uh, a little bit more generalized in, in that case. And, and this is uh, really in response to the decadal survey, which is more geared towards, uh, towards observation and measurements rather than, uh, than missions. So, <clears throat> uh, and the assets can be uh, in, in this generalized sensor web, the assets can be NASA or non NASA uh, assets. So uh, traditionally, the missions at NASA have been monolithic, with uh, usually large, uh, a large spacecraft uh, geared towards one particular measurement. 
uh, with, uh, with the development of, of new technologies, uh, in particular the miniaturization of spacecraft and instrument, and also the capability uh, to handle uh, large amounts of data both, uh, both on board and uh, on the ground, the, the, this uh, new observing strategy are going to utilize this distributed spacecraft mission as well as the coordination of this, uh, these measurements from, uh, from this diverse uh, point of view. <clears throat> so, so what we call new observing strategies uh, is really the, the idea of, of looking at all the, the possibilities of multiple collaborative sensor nodes that, are, that, uh, that, that will um, produce measurements that we can integrate and, and they, they look at multiple vantage points, multiple resolution, and this resolution can be temporal, spectral, spatial, and, uh, and angular. And, uh, and this, would, uh, this would allow us to, um, to, to produce a more complete and a more dynamic uh, picture of, uh, of the of science phenomena. So, so this is very similar to the old sensor web concept, but in which one node can be an individual sensor, or can be a, a constellation itself. So it's really a, a system of, uh, of systems. And, um, <clears throat> and a special case of, uh, of what we call a DSM or a distributed spacecraft mission is what, uh, what we, we call an intelligent and collaborative constellation, uh, where, uh, which, is really, uh, which involves a combination of real-time data understanding, usually on board, uh, situational awareness of the of each spacecraft on its own, but also the spacecraft within the, the constellation, uh, being able to to do problem solving on board, uh, this, uh, of course, uh, decision making on board, communicating uh, between uh, between the, the the different nodes of the of the constellation, and being able to take a decision based on this uh, collaborative sensing instead of uh, of one particular uh, uh, instrument. So uh, th this is uh, one of, of the scenarios, uh, uh, there are several scenarios, but uh, this is, for example, the scenario where we, uh, where we are looking at the measurement acquisition and uh, if, uh, if, uh, if there is a request for a new measurement, uh, uh, we go through, uh, through a different number of steps to look at uh, the different assets that already exist in space, uh, in, in uh, aerial or on the ground, or in situ and uh, see how we can obtain that measurements uh, either using existing assets and uh, or uh, either with one uh, sensor or with combining several sensors or maybe uh, augmenting the, the, the a combination of multiple sensors with a new one either uh, on, the, on the ground or maybe uh, having a flight path of a, of a UAV uh, or uh, designing a completely new uh, observing uh, systems, and this observing system can be traditionally monolithic, or it can be uh, um, a combination of uh, multiple uh, multiple sensors, uh, either in space or uh, or a combination. So uh, another scenario, and I am not going to go into this one, but it's a, it's a scenario. This one where we where uh, we look at um, at uh, at an event of interest in space and how to respond very quickly to this, uh, to this event of interest by targeting multiple measurements from, uh, from multiple, multiple angles. So right now we are uh, looking at uh, different use cases that will inform how we, we design this uh, new observing uh, concepts. And, um, and the, first, uh, use case, uh, the first type of uh, use case that we are looking at are uh, flood monitoring, and this is one specific type of, uh, of a use case, and we, we, uh, we um, design a certain number of use cases, and uh, then we are going to look at other domains, such as uh, air quality or disaster management for, uh, for this type of use cases. So the first, this is one of the first ones that we developed where uh, a radar image in, uh, in space indicates the potential for, uh, for flood-inducing uh, precipitation, and this is going to trigger a network of ground-based uh, sensors to, uh, to, to take more rapid measurements, for example. And then these uh, this new measurements added to uh, maybe a science model can, uh, can trigger some other types of measurements, either in space or, uh, or in situ. 
and uh, and maybe um, they, they, uh, we we have been talking with uh, with a small um, a small company that just started um, of uh, radar CubeSat, which uh, which could maybe target one of their CubeSat to uh, to take uh, more uh, more precise measurements. So for to to be able to develop uh, this uh, this type of um, of, uh, of concepts, uh, a certain number of, uh, of technologies that need to be developed, and, uh, and I, I listed some of them here, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but some of these technologies already exist, uh, but not, have not necessarily been integrated within a system, and some of the technologies uh, do not exist or do not exist at the level of uh, capabilities at, at the capability level that we, we, we require for these concepts. So uh, our, uh, our first step is to, uh, to build uh, what, uh, a test bed that, uh, that will allow us to test these technologies individual, individually and also as a, as a system. So looking at, 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 uh, at it as a system of system to, so to validate uh, these different technologies. Once uh, the, the, the framework for this testbed will be uh, will be developed, we will be able to demonstrate some novel uh, distributed operation concepts, and uh, and then uh, we we could uh, we could play the game of uh, plug and play and remove one technology to put another one and be able to to compare uh, um, several uh, technologies in a very meaningful fashion since uh, the conditions will be the same. And, uh, and finally, the, the, one of the, the final goal is to raise the TRL level of these technologies uh, as a system and, uh, and so reduce the risk of integrating these technologies in actual uh, missions. So, so this will allow us to start and uh, being able to, uh, to, to do some, uh, some infusion more easily. Uh, so the test bed is going to, to be developed uh, in, a, in an iterative fashion. So uh, at first we will have just a, a few nodes, three or four nodes, and then progressively we are going to add uh, more nodes, uh, either uh, on, on the ground or maybe uh, working with the invest program also at, uh, at ESTO to add a CubeSat that would uh, represent a, a space node. So at first it will be simulated nodes on the ground and then progressively we are going to add uh, we are also talking with uh, with the USGS to have some uh, river gauges maybe to add to the to the network, and uh, and then the next step would be to uh, add maybe a CubeSat and then talk to maybe some um, some uh, international uh, um, entity and uh, organizations and have some uh, some other nodes. So uh, and and once we have this uh, this uh, testbed in place, we will be able to integrate it in the solicitation process of uh, of AIST. So this is a uh, this is a current concept. This is a little bit a picture of, of my brain. So it's very it's a little bit hard to read. But mainly what right now we the, the idea is that we we will have these uh, these different nodes, and uh, we have um, we have defined a certain number of use cases. We also have four pilot projects uh, looking at different aspects of, uh, of the technology and the capabilities that are required. So we are going to build the first version of the test bed that integrates this pilot project and that uh, to make a first demonstration of the, of the concepts. And, uh, and then uh, very recently we, uh, we awarded a certain number of, uh, of AIST 18 projects and these are the projects that are uh, at the top that are relevant to the testbed. Um, so we have four uh, projects that are relevant to the testbed and that will eventually be also integrated in the testbed and demonstrated within the testbed. And, uh, and we also have some, uh, some uh, OC style projects that will uh, that will be able to inform this kind of uh, new um, uh, new uh, new mission concepts. So so the test bed can be uh, a little bit seen as as uh, as an as an OC or an OST if if we replace the the, the one of the S by the test bed, and uh, and uh, we will be able to to uh, to have a, a loop where we where there is a, a, a mission concept that can be designed then that is run through the, the, the concept 
the architecture can be run through the test bed, and then we go back to the to the OC and uh, and we can refine the, the concept. So uh, the the different use cases that we are defining are going to uh, to inform uh, the architecture uh, of the framework of the test bed and. Uh, and uh, we are in the in the first phases of uh, of defining this uh, this architecture, the System Engineering Research Center, uh, led by uh, Stevens uh, Institute of Technology, is uh, is uh, working on this architecture. And these are uh, three uh, of the of the reference uh, mission uh, reference uh, general type of reference missions that we are looking at. And that uh, for for which we will uh, we will develop the, the general capabilities of, of the test bed. So they are uh, so they represent different levels of capabilities, different lengths of the mission, uh, different uh, levels of reaction that are, that are needed from uh, from this type of uh, new observing strategies. So uh, in the future direction, we are uh, we are uh, uh, as I said. We have a certain number of uh, number of use cases, and we are going to augment this uh, this number. We are uh, going to build some uh, some roadmap of the technologies that are needed, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, defining the needs of of the technologies, the gaps, and see which one are the most cross cutting and need to be to be developed. And um, and then we will uh, we will uh, transition and infuse this technology, and at the same time. Uh, we will uh, we will um, make some uh, uh, requests for experiments to run on the test bed, that, and and it will also define uh, other technologies to to be developed. So uh, uh, just like there is an Internet of Things, the idea is really to to define the Internet of of space, which uh, I mean it's space and uh, and other uh, other uh, nodes on. Uh, so and and make something a little bit more uh, more transparent and seamless. That's it. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have a couple minutes for questions as we transition. Can I just remind everybody? You have to get your face like very uncomfortably close to this microphone when you when you talk. <laughs> Uh, this looks interesting. Is it going to be the way that people can monitor this, this goes along? Uh, excuse me, can you repeat? That, will we be able to kind of monitor the progress as uh, this, these test beds move forward? Yes, uh -huh. yes. I mean, we will have a regular, uh, regular. Um, we we will have a board, a government's board, government's board, and we will have. Uh, so so we will report regularly on the type of thing that we are doing. And uh, and I hope that uh, that uh, uh, the software that will be involved in the testbed will become open source, so so that it becomes part of the community also. A lot of what you're doing here is useful in this project as well. So. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Another question? Can I ask which uh, like the which offices the project manage that? Someone was trying to ask a question in the computer. All right, great. Uh, we do have a question online. Let me see if I can find you. That is. Uh, Daniel, can you hear us? Yes. You're my go-to. Uh, are you the one with the question? I am. I was wondering how far along are you in uh, building the group of cl uh, uh, the, the collaborative group of testbed partners for in situ measure in situ measurements. The question is how far along is NASA mm -hmm. with build, building the breadboards for and, and test methods for in situ methods? Did I summarize that well, Daniel? The the, the actually the uh, the collaborators the, the, the collaborating institutions for the uh, for the surface in situ measurements. Yes, right now for the institute collaborator, we are just uh, starting. We only talked to um, to USGS, which is your uh, your other uh, your sister institution, yes. which is at uh, Ames. Oh yes, yes, uh -huh. yes. Uh, John Stock. John Stock. Right? Yes, so so, so th we are just starting. This is a uh, and this is why we are we are uh, presenting this uh, this uh, this work everywhere. We, we would really like to involve a, a larger community. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. And like I said, we're gonna have an extended session at the end. So if there are questions that come to folks, um, we can discuss them then. The next speaker we're gonna have is David Coyle from the USGS. I've had a, it's been a great experience for me to uh, meet and work with David over the past year. Um, David is an IT specialist and I am not. So he has done a fantastic job of putting up with a high degree of ignorance. And uh, David is here to talk to us about NGWAS, which is the USGS's next generation water observation uh, system project, which is playing out over the US where select basins are being uh, targeted for extended monitoring. And then a focus on low power wide area network um, experimentation. All right, David, let's uh, get you to take it away. You. God, uh, tabs there work. So this is a pointer that you can do. And I'll give you a five minute. Okay. So, yeah, I'm David Coyle. We work with, um, I'm in Reston, Joe's in Baltimore. We're working on a this next generation water observing system, which um, we're kind of afraid to call it next generation because a few years from now, we'll probably be old, but um, this was uh, initiated in 2019 and it's going to go forward into 2020. We're also going to include other, other basins um, such as out west. So this is the first iteration of this next generation uh, observing system. And here are some of the people. Um, the Delaware River Basin actually starts in uh, New York State, so we have the New York, New York Water Science Center um, and other water science centers such as Pennsylvania. Um, so we're, we're trying to bring in this group together of, of hydrologists and also technical people, and we're, we're looking at the, deploying the equipment and also the operational cost, you know, what's the operational cost of deploying a sensor? Um, because we're, the, the big idea is that we're trying to move into this LP wind technology. Another, another thing we're doing, which, which Joe can talk about, is, um, which should be interesting because there seems to be some projects from NASA here, um, is, is NASA tech, technical readiness levels. And so we, we've instituted a form of testing that kind of includes a, a form of testing, which is kind of like ISO 9000 testing. And so in, in our evaluation of these, these LoRaWAN and similar sensor networks, we're, we're trying to bring a sort of a formal process to that. And Joe can talk about that later. So if, if you're not already familiar with it, uh, TRL7 is basically what we're shooting at for something to become you know, worthy of, of using, you know, at least in an experimental basis. And so one of the things we want to do with these low costs, traditionally, we've had, um, uh, it's, you know, $30,000 to set up a USGS gauge site with uh, high, high cost sensors and high cost data loggers, satellite communications. Um, what we're looking to do is with the, with the LoRaWAN is to add, well, a couple of things. You add a gateway to an existing US stream gauge site, which we feel is a huge opportunity. And then in addition, use um, gateways that could be standalone. And in addition to that, use existing gateway networks such as Senate Code, which, is, which has a, a system where you can basically use their gateways. Um, and we don't want to test a number of things. Um, one, one of those is, um, well, one of those that occurred to me in the last talk is the soil moisture network. That would be really interesting from that previous project where we want to have the ground truthing of the, of the sensor, of soil moisture sensors. And um, the person at Seneca was even saying that ultimately um, agriculture and farms, um, if they're willing, they can even sell their data or give their data as data products. So all of those can be sort of aggregating into LoRaWAN and other networks into data, data products that can, that can be integrated. So this is a, a map of the of the Delaware River Basin, and um, I'll show you 
what, one of the things that we're monitoring, which, which Joe can talk about more you know, from a hydrologist perspective, is salt line. Basically, when the salt line encroaches on the Philadelphia water supply, that puts the water supply at threat. So the mechanism to, to remedy that is to dump water from the reservoirs in upstate New York, such as you saw in the first picture. And, um, and, that, and when, when we do that, we also want to look at things like the, the effects of that, such as temperature. And that's one of the reasons why we want to have a, a what we're calling a dense te temperature network. And then also, um, there's the modeling side of that, which, which Joe should also address later if you're interested in this. From the modeling side, we need to do the model. We have people that are going to do the modeling for a temperature network. And that's something that other organizations might be interested in. Uh, so here's a study area. Um, it turns out you know, we, we bought some lower WAN equipment, but it turns out with the Senate network, they have a network coverage, which is at least close into the Philadelphia municipal area. So this is interesting in that with LoRaWAN, you can build your own network and be free you know, from the big telco cellular providers. But also there are existing networks such as the Things Network and Seneca where you can tie into their network. Another thing we wanna test is the redundancy with the a LoRaWAN sensor is transmitting RF uh, to, to, the Lord, to the gateway, which is basically a radio gateway. So that actually pr provides multiple redundancy. So if one gateway goes down, then the uh, other can continue. And there's, you, you, there's an architecture diagram that you, a lot of you may, may have already seen that in the, at, at the network server level, then those, those signals are deduplicated. So this is basically, um, you know, some people are probably already familiar with this, but the LoRa has um, a much more um, capability in miles. And Joe, let me know when I'm getting to the end of my time. Yeah, that's it. In, in miles. Um, uh, there's also another, um, there's a, if you look at LP WAN, there's actually a whole array of technologies. Um, so um, each technology has its own capabilities. And then, then again, every six months or a year, each technology like Bluetooth LE is advancing farther and farther. And, and there's, there's, it's all based on spread spectrum radio. Uh, some of those products like, um, some of those products actually, LoRaWAN realizes about a 30% advantage through the spread spectrum technology. Um, some of the other technologies have even more capability of sending multiple channels uh, over, over that um, bandwidth. So one of the things that Joe asked me to talk about was speed versus distance. Um, I actually did a whole different presentation looking at the RF, how does the actual RF sp spread spectrum radio technology work? So actually I kind of fell down that rabbit hole. I have another presentation on that, but that's probably it, unless you're an RF engineer, you may or may not be interested in that, but it is interesting to see how the actual technology works and, um, and, how, and how radio technology has evolved. But there's, there's definitely, there's, there's three different class, classes of service and there's this thing called a spread factor. And um, we actually talked with multi-tech and so it's basically there's power, um, power versus um, bandwidth and distance, which is the classic you know, information theory uh, equation. And LoRaWAN solves this problem by having spread factors. So you can have, you can send 15 kilometers, but you maybe only be able to send 11 bytes of, of coherent uh, information. If, you, if it's just one mile away or half a mile, then you can send up to 250 or 300 bytes, depending on the US or Europe. And so a lot of programmers, sort of IoT sensor programmers, have conversations about how they can optimize that. But multi-tech is actually saying, um, don't optimize it, just let the gateway do it. Because the gateway is actually dynamic, which is called adaptive data rate. So the gateway is actually measuring things 
which makes a lot of sense because one one day a sensor might be mobile and another day a car might be parked over the sensor or one day there might be interference and the next day there's not. So I think the ability of the gateway um, to, to modify those sort of classes of service. And then uh, speaking of classes of service, there's, there's three classes of service, which is basically, I, I, was, I didn't get a chance to put a, put a diagram in there, um, but uh, you, can, you can basically download data. There, there's some, some, there's no standard for things like over the air firmware updates, but there's, there's some attempts to do that. And so that hopefully will become standardized, but basically there's three classes of service and that basically says when, when you can send, how long you can be on the air. There's also a policy about how long you can be on, be on the air. So um, th those are very tightly controlled. So th the thing to realize is that, you know, if, you're, if you want a real-time sensor that's sending a lot of data, it's not really the application for you. Um, although you, you could aggregate the data and send the package of data of time series or average data, you know, every 15 minutes or, 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 or less often. So um, here's, here's an example of some sensors that we've looked at. Uh, I particularly like Libelium. Even though they're expensive, they have a, a comprehensive programming library and they version control everything. So as, as a developer, um, that's very appealing. I'll, however, they do have sort of a walled garden approach and working with our sensor vendors, we're trying to stay away from that, those walled gardens. So that's kind of a tricky, um, one of the ones we're looking at just for the proof of concept demo is Laird. And Laird is interesting because they have a, a time sync feature and um, which you have to implement on your side. It, but if you use the, the thing network in my devices, they've actually implemented, there, there's a sort of a basic protocol called KN, but um, my devices has completely implemented the layered protocol, which you can read. You go to the layered website, you can actually read it. It's about five, eight or nine pages of technical documentation. But they have a way of sending that this has come a lot, up a lot something which hopefully becomes standardized, sending the time synchronization to the sensor. So when the sensor claims that it took an observation at 12 midnight, that that's actually 12, 12 midnight. And here's, here's some examples of some more sensors. Here's, a, here's our classic Campbell temperature sensor, which would go by cable to, to a classic data logger. And here in the middle is a sensor terra soil moisture sensor which actually can, you can get as turnkey, which is again, it's a little bit of a walled garden approach, but from a, from a deployment point of view, you can hammer this into the ground, take your cell phone and tell it what's, what's the soil type, a couple of parameters like that. And your deployment time is, is, uh, is it three minutes? Um, your deployment time is as, as little as, as five minutes. So here's, here's the uh, Norway and gateway. We've looked at, spent some time look, looking at these gateways. Um, it's interesting because the layered gateway that's on the left, layered gateway, can, all it can do is take in Norway traffic and forward it up to a network like the Things Network or Seneca. It, it, whereas the, the multi-tech has a basically a couple of options where you, you, you can actually run not only run your own radio network, but you can run your own LoRaWAN network. And where security is an issue, that's an, that's an advantage. So LoRaWAN, you can actually host, this is, you could call this an edge computing capability. It's actually, you can log into it. It's a, it's a Linux system um, that you can log into and write applications on. And it, you can run the network server directly on the multi-tech and then multi-tech provides other other facilities such as key management. So you can run the, a complete a LoRaWAN system without having to buy in to the things network and things like that. And um, so there's some claims that you can have 50 times um, less uh, cost of operating cost. So you have a the cap, cap, CapEx versus OpEx. You have a little bit more to buy the gateway. Um, 
So that's about it for uh, 15 minutes. I uh, just wanted to show the architecture diagram, which you'll probably see a couple of these. There's, there's the basic architecture that we were talking about with the sensors, um, the idea of the multiple gateways, so the multiple redundancy if one of those gateways goes down. That's, that's something we, we hope to test in um, the Philadelphia. We're setting up a, a site in Philadelphia Seaport Museum. And then the network server takes all that in and what's, through what's called the backhaul, which would be like a cellular or an internet link. And then you know, the application server layer, at some point you decode those packets and then you send them off to the data, data visualization. So um, that, I think that's about it for, for 15 minutes. If there's any questions, let me know. Thank you. Like she showed a Libellium yeah. sensor. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really popular one because it's popular in smart cities. It's got open interfaces on it. Have you been using it? And if so, what's your experience? I haven't used it, but I've, I've certainly appreciated reading the you know the source code and, and the programming manuals. Um, I, you know, a lot of this sensor. A lot of the similar technologies we've looked at, they don't have that, you know, they don't have all of that developer support. So I, I will say that it's very compelling. So you're network. Network. Yeah, you're kind of on your own. Yeah, right. right. But, but the cost of some of those is really low. Like there's one that's $100 for, um, for a gateway, I know for a sensor platform, for the SDI 12 sensor platform. Oh, go ahead. So I see we're up to the transport level. Yeah. What are you, what are you putting on top of the transport? Level? Well, the, um, the the back, you know, from the back hall back to if you're talking about the the big blue circle in the middle, the network server. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the, initially we're going to look at using Senate Co. <laughs> Senate Co. Uh, kind of, uh, they're um, they seem to be, you know. I sort of prefer them for different reasons to the things network, especially because they have a network in Philadelphia. And so we're going to look at that as as the server. But we're also going to from that stage, we've got we've got some projects. One of them was, was uh, Amazon Greengrass, which we're using with our uh, um, uh, velocity, which is the um, looking at the velocity of, of the. Um, for, for the stream velocity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so we have some other projects. So we, from there, we hope to tie that in, and uh, I'm looking at influx DB, and in some other ways to sort of, you know, do basically the first stage is just going to be a proof of concept, um, and just put some basic analyses on there, and, and hopefully make it available for real um, modelers to to access the data from that from that sort of staging area. Quickly, one more question. We'll use this time. Uh, Dan's going to run over and work a little bit on the audio. So uh, go ahead. Maybe we'll bounce the mic back. Sure. Yeah, my, my question is just quick. Too. I want to congratulate you guys on using NASA to our own I've worked at NASA and NOAA, and NOAA doesn't use our own as much. And it's so much easier to talk about technology when you've got that common language. So my question is what you guys get your you know, your sensor system up to TRL 7 or TRL 8. Are you thinking long term about commercializing this at one point, or will it always be an internal USGS system? It's a great question. Um, but it's a great question. What we would like to use it for is a, a cross spectrum of that. We, we would like to have a private component where USGS only, if you will, or maybe um, DOI agency, if you will. And then another side of it that would promote the citizen science, which is a fantastic session we just came from with the meteorological equipment. So, so, so what we're testing is something across, you know, completely closed down, nobody sees anything absolutely secure to World Wide Web applications where folks can say, hey, I have this sensor, I'm at this school, I want to be on your map. So all of these are very, I mean, they're incipient stages. The Private one is is further along than than the others, and and it will follow that way. The fascinated about your uh, comment about TRLs. Maybe we can talk about it a bit more at the end because it's we we are looking at a, a hybrid spectrum between the product maturity 
side of the house as well as the technology readiness. The survey works a lot with off-the-shelf equipment that doesn't often work as in line with what we want to do. So then we go through this whole iter iteration of making it work for us. So um, uh, thanks, David. So let's give David a round of applause. Uh, the, the next speaker that we'll have check, check. and uh, th this is kind of fun because I, my first ESIP meeting was in Tacoma, and David Coyle turned me on to the ESIP group. I met James there, I met Jacqueline there, and and Daniel online from Virginia Tech, our last speaker, right? I, I met him there as well. So it, as it turned out, I was able to draw from this community to build this session. So um, it, it's kind of fun. Uh, good. Thank you, thank you, Dan, for helping us with the audio. James, yours should be open. Oh, okay. Um, that could be it. I don't know which one it is. Why don't we just open one of them and we'll see. That's it? Yeah, why don't we press the little, you can go that way if you want to. That's the I'll one. let you drive. That's the one to press, I think. Okay. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I'm James Gallagher, I'm from OpenDAP, and I'm going to be talking about another project that uses LoRa. Um, uh, my, my, I'm presenting this work, the PI on the work is Martha Apple, and um, other participants include Kevin Negus. Martha and Kevin are both uh, professors at Montana Tech, who's one of the newest members, of Montana Tech is one of the newest members of ESIP. And uh, three students, Samuel, Tyler, and Carson, have also worked on this. You, you may, yes. Use slideshow. No worries, man. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but oh, and let's make this go away too. Okay, so, so first off, this is about developing a sensor network that will function in snowy alpine environments, and this is a progress report on our work so far. Um, how do I, oh, down here, all right, okay. Yeah, I tried that, but anyways, okay. So, okay, underlying all of this, here's the reality. We're doing this work because of the importance of alpine plants in detecting and monitoring climate change. All of the other stuff I'm gonna say in the rest of the talk is super cool for me because I'm a techie guy, but this is the reason why, and everything is derived from this. So I want to give you um, first an overview about the open source hardware movement. And the reason I want to do that is because it came as a real surprise to me that this even exists. And I think that unless you know about it, it might be sort of surprising to you too. Then I'm going to talk about our designs and I'm going to skip over the low raw background because I think that's been covered pretty well. And then I'm going to talk about our test implementations so far. Um, so about open source hardware. So it's clearly aligned with the open source software movement, um, and it refers to the design specifications of physical objects that are licensed in such a way that those things can be studied, they can be made, they can be distributed, they can be modified by anyone. So for example, the Arduino MCU uh, ecosystem is both hardware and software, and those Arduino boards, those tiny MCU computers, can be made by anyone and sold or whatever, just as you can do with open source software. Um, of course, unlike open source software, you can't download a physical thing on the internet and have it, but, but, the, but you can download design documents. Um, there are companies, commercial companies, that support this, just like there's Red Hat in the Linux world that supports open source software. There are companies like Adafruit, Spark, Fun, C, even Mauser, OSH Park. All of these companies support this open source hardware, I'll call it ecosystem, for lack of a better word. Um, there are tools like Arduino, which I mentioned, Fritzing, which is a computer-aided uh, design uh, language for circuits and, and uh, PC board development, GitHub, Bitbucket, you know, for code. All of these things are free, and they're all actually surprisingly powerful design tools. And then there are organizations. So that's um, that's those are important things to know. 
And there's a little bit more information tacked on the end of this presentation that I won't have time to cover that you can you can access later on because these slides will be saved. But the most important thing about the open source hardware movement is that it provides a place where developers can share ideas and they can find out what other people have found that has worked for them. And so we can build devices that are relatively low cost, like ones that have mass market appeal, even though our ideas probably don't. And that's because most people do not need to put sensors at the tops of mountains. Most people don't. It's cool to do that, but anyways. And so now I wanna talk about our design so far. Okay, and so this is a picture of one of the deployment sites. I believe this is Goat Flat. It's in the Pintler Mountains in Montana. It's about 9,000 feet. And this is what it looks like in the early fall. So um, the requirements for our project is the, are that we want to do soil temperature and moisture monitoring. And that's kind of where we're starting out. Um, we need these sensor networks to operate unintended in these remote and harsh environments. We need remote connectivity because access to these environments in any given year is not 100% guaranteed. That means even during the summer, you may not be able to get there. So, and we also need them to be extremely low cost um, because the other requirements weren't hard enough, right? Of course, we need them to be low cost. Um, so sensor networks, so the basic design is that, well, Actually, this slide mixes the notions of requirements and designs and goals, but we're calling it basic design because um, it's a 15 minute talk. So we're gonna, we want to initially put these sensors at at least one research site and that's the Goat Flat, which I showed the picture of before. But there are other sites that we have in Glacier Park and at other locations in the Pintler and Pioneer Mountains in Montana. Um, we need, or we would like the sensors to run on battery power for at least two years unattended. Um, we plan on using low raw radio to connect the sensor nodes in a kind of a star pattern to a master node. And we're gonna use a master node to forward the data to the internet. So it's very similar to the previous talk in some sense. Um, the master node right now, um, and I'll get to this in a moment, is using satellite, a satellite modem for uplink to the network. Um, subsequent technologies might use, uh, or subsequent implementations might use other technologies. Um, data to them, data from the master node will be sent to an application server so that it can be accessed and stored. And so we've developed, we've actually experimented with a couple of different types of application servers. Again, there's more on that a bit later. Um, the master node itself can also be functioning as a, as a kind of a mini weather station. Um, it doesn't have to be particularly sophisticated, but there is one thing that we kind of, that I kind of skipped over in the early bits, and that's that those sensor nodes, we need to be able to collect information at uh, accuracy and precision levels good enough for scientific publication. So anyways, um, this is a kind of a little discussion about low raw and this notion of star nodes. So here's a basic low raw setup. You've got a bunch of leaf nodes out there. They're sensors, and there's a master node hooked up to the internet. And the operation is for these kinds of situations is pretty simple. Everything is asleep and essentially consuming no power for virtually all of the time. But periodically, for about two seconds, the sensor nodes wake up, and they take their measurements, and they send the information to the master node, and then they go back to sleep for another hour or so. The master node then sends the information up to an application server, and then the master node goes back to sleep. So, um, test implementation. One of the things you notice about that previous uh, little animation is that there was a lot of talk about sleeping there. <laughs> These nodes are asleep most of the time, right? There's 3,600 seconds in an hour and everything was actually only running for two of those seconds, so not very much time. Um, and so how you, how you keep the nodes not consuming much power at all and wake them up is really key. Um, this project has actually been going for almost a year, but, we, but it was in not till the fall of 2019 that we got uh, another MTech faculty member, Kevin, who's in the EE department, and three EE students working on the master node. And, and they kind of ran with it and designed the master node um, 
all pretty much on their own. The idea behind their design is for the master node to function independently, if potentially independently. Um, and they decided to use a satellite module to connect to the internet. We had initially thought that we might use cell connectivity, but the reality is that there probably is not good cell connectivity in these locations. Um, so the, the, uh, the notion of using a satellite modem brings the cost up significantly. Um, they also decided to use a microcontroller with a real time clock as their power latch. Um, that's a more expensive type of power latch than, than what we have in the sense in the leaf nodes, um, but it's probably also more realistic. And, and their, their, uh, their tests and their computations show that they can build this device and run it at 3.3 amp hours per year. Um, right now, their master node doesn't actually have low raw capability in it, but, um, but it will be really easy to add that, partly because the MCU they're using for their latch is easily extendable to include low raw. Um, test implementation of the sensor node. Here's an exciting picture off to the right of one of the prototypes. Um, um, this, this combines a low RAW with an Arduino and some temperature and moisture sensors. Um, we've experimented with a couple of different types of, of moisture sensors. Temperature sensors are really pretty easy. It's the moisture sensors that are actually pretty complicated. Um, but we're using uh, lithium manganese oxide batteries. We know that the temperature floor of our deployment environments is about 50 below. So we need batteries that can hold their voltage down to about that level. Um, we've tested the prototypes down to 25 below. Um, the total parts, we wanna try to keep that below $50 per unit. And we think we can actually go to much lower than that, but um, it's much more convenient to spend a bit more in the open source hardware market and get things from like SparkFun and Adafruit that you can easily breadboard and easily solder together. Later on, we'll move into lower cost devices. Um, in this case, we used a discrete component. I, I developed a discrete component power latch that uses a couple of transistors to do that. And we can run this at one amp hour per year. Um, so here's some implementation notes about what we've tested so far. Um, and we have some of this stuff um, in a cord server, some data in a cord server uh, running, that's running in the Amazon cloud. And we also have some other information on a GitHub site and those links are embedded in this, in this presentation. How much time do I have? Five minutes, yeah, okay, that's good. So the satellite um, uplink was chosen because we needed to broaden the potential number of places we could deploy this. Um, but there, is, there are other issues. Um, there's another actual requirement, something that should be on the slides. A lot of the places that we're deploying are forest service land and, or public or parks. Some of the places are in Glacier Park. And so we're not supposed to have anything visible above ground. And so that's a real challenge. Okay, all this technology uses relatively high frequencies. In the picture that Dave showed, you saw the low raw runs from 915 to, well, in the US it runs at 915 megahertz. So there's serious issues with attenuation there. Um, the other thing that we just, so, so we dropped cell phones and we went to satellites. That's one thing that we learned. The other thing is that um, both, both independently, Developers at the developers at OpenDAP, I'm the developers at OpenDAP, um, and the folks at MTech independently decided that power latches were, were a better way to control the power than just having the MCU sleep and trying to sleep the peripherals. The, the MCUs control power really well within their sleep modes, but it's the peripherals that continue to suck it down. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't get across that barrier. So that's where I went with the latch. Um, the low ROP protocol. I found that if I simulated a fair number of nodes talking to a master node using simple point-to-point -point communications, just like the lowest level, forget about all the low raw WAN and everything, um, it, didn't, it didn't really work. And that was because of collisions. And so I decided to move to a reliable datagram version. And there's pretty good implementations for that in the open source software stack. Similarly, we need an application server and you talked about ThingSpeak and that whole environment. Um, cords 
implements a really a pretty good open source version. Mike's in the audience. Um, Erdap is another is an open DAP server that also enables the same kind of thing so that you can push stuff up from the master node. Um, either one of those will work and they're both pretty good and they're both open source. Questions? And I should say that I have some more information about low raw and a bunch of other stuff. There's about another 10 slides here, but, but you've got the basic picture of what we're doing. And one thing I should mention that's kind of cool, low raw was actually developed by an actress named Hedy Lamar and an avant-garde composer named George Anthill. And it's just the coolest thing. So it's wonderful to read about. Okay, questions. She has the, uh, had the uh, um, patent for spread spectrum. That's right. Which is really cool. Uh, did you consider using amateur radio? Um, no, we didn't. But um, I do know that the Snowtel network uses something called Meteor Burst Radio yes. Yes. to move information out of their sites to a central location. And, and I did think about that. But the thing is, I think amateur radio or, or the Meteor Burst Radio requires a larger physical installation than the satellite modem unit, which is actually pretty small. Yeah. But we are really concerned about the footprint of the devices in the field. So the little thing that I showed you will, will be much smaller than a pack of cards in its final realization. This is going to sound off the wall, but since it has to be hidden, have you considered making an artificial tree limb and hanging it? There aren't typically trees in these environments. This okay. is above tree line. Darn. Yeah. So how do you bury it, or do you have it in, in so, Of course, it's going to so be. I, so yeah. the current experimental protocol for most of this alpine work is the very small temperature sensors. Mm -hmm. And they're essentially mini data loggers. Mm -hmm. They're used a lot in food science, I think. And they're about, about the diameter of a quarter and about, about yo thick. So they're buried. And then the researcher goes into the field and digs them up and typically brings them back to the lab. It downloads the data. And if there's battery power that's significant left, you take them back into the field and put them back in. So you can't get data until you physically access it. And if a sensor breaks, you, you're kind of screwed. And there's no adaptability either. David talked a bit about adaptability. But I got to yield the floor to. Um, one more question. I'll get Daniel going. So okay, you get, get Daniel going. Side. I'll. I have to talk into the microphone. Otherwise, Daniel can here. Here, I'll just lean over like this. If there's another question. Is, is there a question online? Is there a question? No. Seems like. Was there another question in the audience? There's another question. Find you. There's a, okay. There's lots of questions. For for the uh, kind of durability that you're requiring, is there uh, is there any thought about having uh, redundancies of uh, any sort in these things that you might have? Um, there should it, be more thought, but we're just starting out. So right now, that uh, some of the redundant, like the redundant star node, or what might be analogous to redundant star nodes, is not something we've looked at. But there could be, yeah, there could be, yeah. All right, Daniel, Daniel Fuca from Virginia Tech is our next speaker. Daniel, do you have us online? I do believe so. Do you hear me? Yeah, we do. Hi, Dan. Aloha, I should say. Let me go into presentation mode. And I, I must say that it really kills me not to be presenting something that is low rod related, because I've been playing with this quite a bit myself and the sensors. But I'll, you'll see a little bit of the sensors that we've developed uh, later on. But uh, there was a request for something related to drones. And so but, uh, I'm pulling a, the uh, project out of hibernation here uh, and really we're just going to call this making drones interesting again in which case this is a use case driven project uh, you know, we want to design and print water quality project drones to fill in spatial surface data gaps and i'll show you a little bit of a reason why later but uh, we're looking at completely new sensor development we're look that we we it, drones are really neat and if you have enough money you can do a lot of really neat things with them um uh, but it's uh, but putting new stuff onto them uh requires a lot more money so one of the things that we don't have is money so we really are trying to make 
what is commonly traditionally uh, the, the drone research, and we're trying to cut the cost about two orders of magnitude uh, so that we can give this stuff to our students. Reason for this is because really it doesn't take too much effort to throw away and destroy $150,000 worth of instrumentation in the drone world. Two orders of magnitude is where we wanna go. So as I mentioned, this is use case uh, driven and I'm, uh, we're going to actually go to the top of the Delaware uh, the, uh, watershed uh, 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 a little bit here. Uh, so you guys might see a uh, small uh, watershed that you recognize for those of you that are familiar with the Delaware River uh, watershed. But uh, we're looking at two different flow processes and we are very interested in what's called saturation excess. So Currently, most hydrological models, most watershed models use a solution that's infiltration excess. And that is just where the precipitation rate is greater than the saturated conductivity of the soil. And so water flows off the surface. Now, what we're very interested in is this area between where you actually have saturation excess where water doesn't flow, it actually infiltrates. And the reason why we wanna look at that is because pretty much everywhere except for the Midwest and Texas, uh, you're dominantly in the infiltration excess uh, paradigm. The other reason why we, we wanna go after this is soils are very important to us uh, in our research. And soil genesis is very well explained by topography. That is, soil goes downhill and it turns out that Lighter particles can go downhill easier than smaller or uh, heavier particles and that kind of stuff. So with that, uh, if we actually look at a location, uh, we can start looking and refining soil uh, soil maps. Whereas this is an area that's classified under Sergo as uh, roughly two to three different soils. We can uh, really increase the resolution of this, especially when we're dealing with saturation excess because if we're looking at phosphorus or other agricultural uh, chemi agro agrochemicals, uh, really the, the phosphorus will store in the field as long as you avoid these areas that are red. Uh, so uh, basically if you model correctly, uh, you can actually find places to store your, uh, 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 store stuff. So we're just gonna go in and say, yeah, soil does go, does move downhill. That's kind of a neat thing. And slay, uh, sand uh, it takes a little bit more energy to move downhill than clay does. Uh, uh, other things that we can know is that if we can determine the hydrology, that is the hydrology of the top, say 10 centimeters of the soil, right before and after a, a storm event, and you, know, you can, actually uh, we know the physics soil physics well enough that we can now start looking and refining those soil maps and uh, just because if we can determine the water movement in the top we can then see uh, we can determine what the saturated conductivity is and then there's relationships between sand silt clay all that kind of fun stuff so what we have found is we can do this very well with ground penetrating radar and that's very useful um, uh, well, one of the problems with ground penetrating radar is it's expensive. Uh, 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 used units is what we look at. And uh, uh, those last studies uh, are on the order of uh, $5,000 to $20,000 worth of equipment to do them. The other thing is after it rains, it, uh, it kind of gets mucky. So you need a little bit more, uh, 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 it's a little bit more money and uh, two old guys to drive around in a, a ATV to be able to do your ground penetrating radar. So what I wanna do is update that in 2003 and say, hey, wait, drones can be cheap. We can buy cheap drone parts. Uh, we can uh, buy cheap sensors. That's what we've been talking about today. And if we print it and we give it to the students, we can take that $150,000 uh, the, the sensing platform and bring it down into the $150 range. So cheap drone parts that are expendable, reusable, you can buy this. It's a pretty nice, it's actually a fairly nice uh, drone with two GPSs in it and it has 
polite following, all that kind of fun stuff. And you can you can inject GPS uh, information so you can actually put in a traffic pattern that you want to scan. Um, and so one of the things then is how do we get the GPR cost down? And that came out of a really, really cool uh, paper that I saw of uh, these two people that were looking for landmines. And the biggest problem that they were having, they're trying to build $20 landmine uh, robots. And they found this, uh, this nice little radar that is kind of, I guess it got modified from uh, and put into production for automotive, uh, being, being able to tell if you're going to hit a uh, hit a curb or something like that. Uh, so th those sensors have become very, very inexpensive. And this group said, oh, yeah, we can find landmines as long as there isn't soil water. And, and there's problems with soil water, uh, which is exactly what I'm looking for. I, I live in a place without landmines, but I'm really interested in measuring soil water. So lo and behold, when, uh, building our sensors, we come back to what is now my favorite Arduino, even though it's way outside of my price range. It, as uh, James can testify, uh, I am uh, I get very upset if my microcontroller costs more than three dollars, uh, uh, and my sensing unit costs too much more than that. But I was willing to go off and uh, go up to fifteen dollar uh, microcontroller, especially because you could get these on sale for roughly ten dollars or uh, the guy at spark fun will send you some if your project is interesting enough anyways so we have now a radar unit uh, 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 that 10 gigahertz uh, uh, unit uh, we have a, a means to get the data a means to transport the data now uh, this is uh, something that you guys might have seen before but this is my $25 multi-science sensor station, GPS. This actually uh, communicates with LoRa. Uh, and then uh, we're developing this as part of a project that uh, James is also on. Uh, uh, so that deals with our data transport and our data redistribution tagging portion of the ESIP conference. Um, so other things that you might need is, hey, wait, now we're flying, we're taking data. And now we're actually putting radars up into the air. And so we end up with a situation where uh, we actually have to give a little bit more education. First, we need the, we need pilots. So we have to be able to pay $150 and uh, set up our students to take an exam for their pilot certification. Uh, the next part is uh, if we're putting radios into the air and flying with them, then we probably also ought to have them study for a ham radio license, which also, as a, a, a question from the last uh, a, a presentation, uh, it, it's useful for being able to uh, transmit data in other fashions and methods. So can we find water? Here we go. Uh, uh, this is our little circuit that we built. Uh, and we got the Arduino. And we have uh, what I call a virtualized drone, I guess. Uh, me and my colleague Roberto going out and uh, starting to do our experiment. And yes, indeed, we can find water. Now, currently, we're somewhere in between the extremely saturated and the unsaturated, but we are developing curves over time uh, whenever, whenever we have time to play with this. Uh, can we print the body? Yes, and so we can take that $160 uh, drone and we can uh, uh, print out a fairly easily modifiable uh, 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 piece there uh, that uh, uh, we can throw our instruments on. Uh, but uh, here what we have is uh, uh, what happens, can you actually do this? You're, you're now building a flying machine and that that. Daniel, are you there? If you're talking, Daniel, you're on mute.
Okay. Uh, right. So we will adjust, right? Um, D Daniel, when well, you can't hear us. Say something when you come back in, okay? Um, great. So we'll wait for Daniel to come back in and um, <clears throat> hang us. Right now, we have a couple of, where are we sitting? We're sitting about 5.15, 7.15 in the evening. We can pivot. Um, if Ben, if you can keep track and maybe see if Daniel comes back in. Uh, I'll, I'll, Uh, let's pivot a bit, uh, ask some questions that maybe people, folks didn't get a chance to ask during some of the other sessions, and then, uh, so let's start there. Are, are there questions, obviously not for Daniel, uh, but uh, for the other three speakers that we didn't get a chance to cover during their presentation slot? And then from this question, we can basically just go into an open discussion. If there's long, awkward silence, I can icebreak. Yeah, uh, I have a question maybe for everyone who's doing on the hardware. Uh, on the en energy side, I said that almost everyone said what kind of battery we need for maintaining the, the system to be running. Is there any study on using the solar panels to, to power that? And uh, if we do, would that impact the detection of the environmental parameters? Sure. Um, solar cells were one of the first things we thought of, and the Forest Service said, absolutely not. <laughs> the other thing that we've, uh, and I should hand this over to, to, to Dave, because you may have very different requirements, but the other thing we have to watch out for is that even though there are not a lot of people in these places, there are a lot of other animals, and so, especially some of the smaller animals have stolen things, and like they they disassemble stuff. So wires, exposed wires. It's like it's imagine like it's like you have like my, when mice get in your car, right? They eat the insulation and stuff like that. So so we have to try to protect these things from animals too. So yeah, solar cells unfortunately not part of the equation, which is too bad. You know, USGS, we we already have solar at most of our sites that are that are remote. <laughs> so that's the idea of adding a like the multi-tech gateway, we, we can run that off. Actually, that runs off of power over Ethernet, which is kind of strange. But we, we, we think that we have the ability to step up or step down the voltage as, as required. Um, but that was an interesting thing, is it, it actually runs 48 volts DC power over Ethernet, which, which is good in a way, because you can actually run a 100-foot cable if, if you need to. Right. And then, you know, one of the interesting things, too, in this session, we're hearing uh, Daniel and James speaking S speaking to the aspect of uh, low cost versus uh, high cost sensors, right? And from my experience with the survey, we, we don't even think about this. We, we don't even hesitate to drop four grand on a probe that may or may not work out. So th this injection, if you will, of type of low power, wide area monitoring in the survey is, is really great because it's starting to expose and really just shine light on how much extra cost there is for features that aren't used that you know are proprietary and stuck in there um, just for marketplace so um, yeah it's, it's really fascinating um, and, and I, I avoid the use of cheap cheap has a place it, they may be cheaply made however the inexpensive yet um, usable uh, sensors um, so that that's been a really interesting thing for me over the past 18 months is to, to learn. So I, so I was going to say, another thing that, that, another thing that you touched on there, um, or actually another thing that Dan touched on was 3D printing, using 3D printing to fabricate components. And one of the components that you might want to 3D print and fabricate is a case because you gotta gotta get small boxes for these things and and in, in like a lot of hobby electronics the sort of the case is like the most expensive part like that's half the cost and and they're often not optimal and you really want again you want the cases to be as small as possible especially for in our design those sensor nodes Yeah, I, I want to just, uh, I've just got a general philosophical question because today's the first time I've ever heard about o o open source hardware. And, you know, philosophically, how do you 
do you even care about protecting the intellectual property of you know what you created and you put this out and and what if your design really you have a design that really does take off and can be used i know you know the whole sharing between you know low impoverished scientists is is extremely good but you know if there is a future and how do you you know evolve the technology to the next level if everybody's doing their own thing uh, yeah so i think okay so i'm not really an expert in open source hardware i'm just a person who's fascinated by it but i'm going to claim to be an expert in open source software and so um but i'm not an expert in its monetization okay because i'm open Dap is a non-profit corporation and you know what non-profit means right so um, but here's the thing, there are ways in open source software to protect the intellectual property of, your, of the development, right? And so, and, and some of those licenses have been litigated, so there's actual case history. And a lot of the open source hardware community is leveraging off of that. So you see similar licenses or you see the software associated with the MC, that runs on the MCUs also licensed by LGPL, for example. So the Radiohead library and the Tiny Low Raw library, those are licenses licensed using LGPL, I believe. Um, Adafruit and Sparkfun, those are two companies that are very tightly bound to this notion of open source hardware. And they're both for-profit corporations. Adafruit was one of Wall Street Journal's 50, you know, most exciting tech companies in, in a recent year. You know, so 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 it, it, it is a viable business model, and there are ways forward to protect intellectual property and to to sell it, to monetize it as well if you're highly successful. It was interesting on the other presentation that I was thinking of showing, but wasn't sure. It was this great article by this security researcher Matt Knight. He, he wrote, he put a presentation called Reversing LoRa. So in 2006, because LoRa itself is proprietary, Semtech bought this French company for $5 million. And so the actual chip is proprietary. But this guy basically reverse engineered the LoRa protocol. And so it's, it seems possible that, you know, it's at some level, the implementation of the sort of the physical physical OSI layer, it could be replaced by open source hardware in, in, in slightly different algorithms, you know, depending on how that goes. Yeah. Oh, let's go. And open source hardware is not just restricted to inexpensive or cheap uh, devices. There's a company called Great Scott Gadgets, which sells what they call Hack RF, which is a software-defined radio peripheral. That is, it's you plug in an antenna, plug it that the box by USB into a computer, and it uh, uh, there is software that runs on the on the native computer, and that's where all the work is done. Uh, but the it, the peripherals up, I think it's 250 bucks, so it's not a cheap box. Uh, but there, there are more and more things like that uh, that are happening, especially like in amateur radio, as we were talking about before. So I think it was during Jacqueline's presentation that the use case of flooding was real interesting to me. And I, I think I caught the point that you made about you'll have situations where you need more essentially real-time gauge type data. And I'm wondering, that got me thinking about citizen science. And I, I wonder whether you or any of the rest of you are kind of thinking about how citizen science can get into the mix. And especially if you have very low cost sensors, could you, for example, deploy some, uh, you know, train volunteers so that instead of a very expensive USGS person uh, going out there or another expensive full-fledged uh, stream gauge, send out a volunteer to uh, check the real-time conditions but with kind of um, voucherable data collection? No, that's a great question and a great comment. And part of the survey's interest in this type of uh, mon level of monitoring, if you will, is disruption, complete disruption of the market. Um, with these budget 
strapped uh, labs, right, where they're soldering their own stuff, building water in their own or making their own uh, wiring harnesses. Uh, that is amazing, and it's really impactful to the bigger corporations who are seeing those orders of magnitudes difference and at the same or near the same level of quality, right? So from the USGS standpoint, we are not going to look to replace everything that we have with this type of stuff. We are looking to use these forms of open source hardware and, and these kind of innovative approaches as an augmentation to the existing networks. So we have a structure a, ne a structured network in place that we can already, we already have the backhaul set up, right? So now we can set up these smaller um, uh, kind of systems of systems, if you will, that can connect back to the main network that's existing and then backhaul the data. And I think this is where uh, Jacqueline's talk comes in is key because when we have that overarching infrastructure, it's really the same uh, across the protocols. You have some aspect of something's making a measurement, something else goes and says, give me that measurement, and then it's either passed along or set up for that backhaul over the cellular network, the Wi-Fi network, the satellite networks. Um, uh, James is trying to get to the rest of uh, Daniel's presentation. We may run out of time. Um, but right, so, so from an aspect of market disruption, right, uh, that, that's a big part of the survey to be able to say, hey, you know, Xylem, YSI, and, and this place is the citizen science component, right, because we can bring monitoring equipment down but you know we're, we look at a, a radar gauge that costs or a radar sensor that's in the range from 12 to eighteen thousand dollars we just got in touch with a company that we're getting into tech transfer agreements and this is to the intellectual property protection right they have open they're using open source um, pieces but how they have them configured and and the software component of them allows them the opportunity to get a patent and then we can get into usgs can get into a tech transfer agreement with them that preserves the intellectual property of the survey members who say, hey, what if we modified it in this sense? And then the manufacturers as well. So um, this is a really fun field and it's been um, drinking from a fire hose from my standpoint for the past 18 months because I knew nothing about tech transfer agreements and and David has been fantastic with um, the, uh, the IT side of things uh, for me. Yes, Jacqueline. Yes, and when when you are talking about citizen science, um, in fact, I, I talked about Internet of Space because I wanted it to relate it to the Internet of Things, and uh, one 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 fun fact that uh, that uh, people have been talking about is, for example, if the windshield wipers of cars were uh, were connected to the Internet of Things, you could measure the precipitation from uh, from the speed of the windshield wipers and <laughs> maybe have some kind of sensor attached to to those but uh, but this is uh, the kind of thing that we can we can imagine we happen at some point and uh, from a, from a citizen science point of view there is also a program at nasa that is called globe and uh, where uh, where the students are uh, are measuring exactly these kind of things in the in the school uh, even elementary school so we could imagine that we could use the, the, this data also So I should say, Dan was almost done with his presentation, but the upshot is that um, <clears throat> there are some legal issues with flying drones. And so you have to actually train the students and the students have to pass an exam because the drones that he showed are over the magic limit. They weigh more than 0.5 pounds. And so, so you have to be heads up about that, but it's not insurmountable. And that actually the drone he had for 160 bucks is pretty darn cool. Okay, um, are we done? We're actually- uh, we're, we're, It's we're, wrap up time, we have about two minutes left. I, I'm supposed to prepare a kind of take home document, if you will, so it, we can just kind of, what a couple of things that I captured, connectivity, right? Communications and connectivity, when when we're, we are looking to bring this community together from points on the ground for space, uh, connectivity and communication between those instruments is key. Um, so what protocols are going to be used? How are they going to be used? And how are they going to be translated and deciphered? Was, was one of the things that stood out. The emergence of, to me it seems a little bit late, but I, I don't know, but to see folks showing 3D printed models and stuff on PowerPoints now is fantastic. And, and I think that's a massive part of disruption. There's a whole nother level to go down with respect to what type of filaments you use, 
but that aspect of disruption, right? So, so that's key. The, the big juggernauts, if you will, for the manufacturers in the environmental sensing realm see this. And I've been on the phone with a lot of them over the past year, and they recognize what's going on. Some have bought into the, the long range, low power monitoring. Others are just waiting to see what's going on. But uh, movements, kind of like what James has shown and what Daniel has shown, are, are disruptive. And it's, uh, it's pretty interesting to see that hit the marketplace. Um, Anything else? Yeah, I do want to mention one thing that I think Dan would talk about if he wasn't here, and that's that he's also working on a really fascinating uh, instance of edge computing, where he's taking those microcontroller units and he's combining them together with TensorFlow on a chip to do um, waveform processing at the edge. So he's listening with a microphone and hearing the sounds of mosquitoes, um, and then he, he analyzes the, the sound, the PCM sound, but then he can send up to a larger machine just the information that he heard a particular type of mosquito, as opposed to sending the sound sample itself. And this is really interesting because he, because he is able to listen to sounds, but then just send the information that he heard a, a particular type of sound, like a female mosquito of such and such type, as opposed to sending the actual sound up, which from a system security and a privacy standpoint is really important. And it's also obviously important for bandwidth sake as well. So there's, and you can imagine that if you just have, like David was saying, you know, a few hundred bytes per packet. So now you can say, I heard this kind of mosquito at this time. Right, and you couldn't do that before. And there's this other privacy issue that's in this mix as well. It's all very fascinating. Yes, in, in the old days, there was memory budgets for programming, right? Now we're in this power budget and, and backhaul budget. Yeah. So, so that ability to, instead of sending a 10 second MP4, which Joe, the, the bulldozer user would do, I would just get a big enough modem to send the data back. We can be creative and, and just send an M or an F ASCII character 11 kilometers over, over more one, right? And, and pick out whether it's a male mosquito, a female mosquito, a bird that's migrating because its chirp has been recognized. And then exactly. the, and, and image processing, right, this kind of goes all the line. Right? Did you see that tree move or, or, or did you see a landslide? Do you see smoke in the distance? Should we look at fires and, and, and stuff like that? Uh, and anybody else? Sure. Chipsets for doing exactly that. I've played with two uh, Nvidia's um, Jetson board and the Deep Lens from Amazon. Both are uh, very uh, easy to program because it's trained in the cloud, deployed to the edge, yeah. and they have all kinds of uh, software developer suites and the like. So if you've got a power to run, especially the Nvidia one is an Arduino board with a super big GPU and heat sink <laughs> on it, but it runs on a USB power, so um, it's really cool. Yeah, right. lot, it's a new world. Thanks. Uh, I'll end the session and just let folks know, EnviroSensing Cluster, part of ESIP, they need on the first Tuesday of every month. That was yesterday. Uh, so the next one will be in February. It's a fantastic group. Scotty Strachan, Renee Brown, again, thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to host this session. And thank you to all the speakers that signed up for this session with me. Um, I appreciate it. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of the time. Thanks.